Thank you, and welcome everybody. Nice to see so many people. I've been in one conference in May, but there were, it was a bit smaller and a bit less people because it was still the aftershake of the pandemic. So, I will be talking about resilience in organizations and why just doing Scrum and Kanban and those things is not, not enough and you need to take a bit more holistic view on, on things. Uh, about myself, I'm a certified coach, I'm ICF certified and Scrum Alliance certified. I do work with uh, people, teams, organizations. I'm doing flow things, uh, portfolio things. Um, I'm having quite a few sessions, one-on-one -on -one sessions with uh, leaders. Um, and I enjoy those a lot. So I'm doing also this professional coaching, and then I'm also part of Agile Finland, active there, and uh, being in the board and organizing different events, as we spoke in the morning. Uh, if you have anything, feel free to contact me or Sari or somebody else from the board. Uh, we have this sticky here. Uh, you can, if you want to have some event in Finland, talk to us. I work for Agile 42. This company was established in 2007. We have coaches uh, around the world, in, in US, in uh, Europe, in South Africa, and then we have some partners also. And those are some of the companies we've been working with, and I've been also in some of those companies. Okay, then the challenge we have today is, uh, and this is a, a curve that um, <coughs> shows the market value and how it develops for a product. Um, if we have, so it, 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 it's from the book, uh, I think Darren uh, mentioned um, Jeffrey Moore, and that's the same guy. So that's crossing the chasm. So first you have, you start growing your business, you have some um, customers coming in, the early innovators, um, and then you, there is a dip uh, in, in, in the value that you create. Uh, that you get it from the market. And you need to cross this, this valley uh, in order when it gets further up. And then you know that you have your footprint in the market is stable and it, it grows up. Um, and then you reach sometimes, you reach the top and then it goes down slowly. Uh, and there are different things that you need to be aware of that. So perhaps you pay attention and think about yourself. Where is your own product in the market curve? that we have here. And you can imaginarily put a cross there and then perhaps reflect during the session what kind of culture and what kind of things you need to have. Um, on the left part, first we do sell the things and then we make them in the beginning. If you know all those Kickstarters and Indiegogo, they, they do sell first the concept. They have the concept and see and test the market value. Or even if you have some new products, you might make a wireframe and ask, you know, hey, register here if you, if you have some uh, interest on, on things. And then you test the market value and you are really in interested in getting quick feedback. Later on, as you go on, then when you know that you have a footprint in the, in the market, then you start making the product and then you start selling the product. So the focus changes uh, in the activity you do. Um, and, and the marketing of the product happens afterwards. Um, all the way until you reach the top, the focus of the organization is on effectiveness because you are growing the value and you want to be more effective and generate the, the most value you can generate. But then when it starts going down, then you need to see the market share does not increase anymore. And in order to keep up the business, you need to focus on cutting your costs down. And that's like uh, declining business and declining your cost. You can a bit like balance this, this losing of, of the income of the market. Another challenge is, and this whole cycle used to be 10 to 20 years. And actually they say that this is now shrinking uh, to five to seven years. But actually we have challenges coming. We had the Euro crisis, we have the Brexit, we had the COVID, we have now the war in, in Ukraine that affect all the market situations. And we have now energy crisis coming up, we have the inflation, and who knows how the world will go. We cannot predict the future that well. And we need to be prepared on reacting to this. And one way that I can 
also say is that this is not anymore like five to seven years, but this is like now two to five years. It will shrink more. So if you want to plan things ahead and you know, have a transformation that takes time, changing the culture takes time. But if you are not prepared to have the right culture beforehand, you cannot adapt to the new situation and you will fail the business. A critical thing is, okay, you have this and if it goes down, you need to find what would be the new wave that will go up so that you can make the shift to the new product. So you need to have new ideas that would be coming up and new things you try out. So this is a challenge. In the pandemic, I've seen some companies that were very good in adapting. And two examples, there is this Finnish gin brand. And when there was this hand sanitizer, um, they realized, OK, we are not going to sell alcohol because the pubs are closed, but people need to, to clean their hands. And uh, there is not enough of that. But we are a distillery. We can produce that. And they very quickly adopted to that. And now you can still find those products in the supermarkets. Um, other distilleries were not able to do that. They were perhaps a bit too late, or they were too, not having the right culture to adapt to the new situation. Or there was, uh, I had a friend who was working in a restaurant, and he said, actually, I have not met him for some time, and then I met him during the pandemic a year ago, and said, oh, it must be, have been really bad for you. And he said, no, not at all. We were working like crazy during the pandemic. And that's not something that you would normally expect from somebody working in a restaurant. But what happened to them? We were very able, very fast to switch to takeaways, and then the people were coming and buying things and ordering things, and we had like lots of things during lunch and during the evening. So that saved them, and they actually had more business, which would be not a, a normal story to hear. Another thing to take into account is that organizations are complex. And last week, I was listening to a talk, a presentation by Simon Compsey, and he was saying that there was this engineering department, and they were having the problem that the projects were late. And they were trying to analyze that engineering department. They were saying, oh, projects are badly estimated. And one solution would be to get a new tool to help better, make better estimations for the project. Well, and then human resources at about the same time, they were saying that people were leaving more frequently. Um, and so they analyzed and asked, so what is it? No, no motivation. We are not learning enough. You know, we want to grow. So they decided to then go and get uh, 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 the proposal. For the solution for them was to offer to the employees an online learning platform. So then they would have a chance to learn. But then when they started analyzing, they realized that it's more complex and that there are actually more reasons behind that. And the two different problems, they were actually connected. And they were connected to the fact down here, maximizing the utilization. They were trying to run too many projects at the same time and utilize the resources they have. And that caused that the people were overloaded. There were too many things being done in parallel. So there were like handovers and people were not able to, to estimate all this handovering and those things. And because they were doing, they were overloaded, they were not having the time for reflection and learning and improving their skills. And this way, they were not able to learn. And that was what Simon told me. So the system, you need to think about the system, and things are more complex than what they seem originally. I would go one step further and say, actually, it's even more complex. When I heard his story, I could start thinking, what about your leadership? What about your strategy? And set up lots of hypotheses about other things. What about your culture? And if you play on one part of the, of the environment, then you might change something, and then something changes on the other part and gets back. So things are complex, and you cannot plan for them up front. Thinking about the culture, the, or the Driving results. This is the pyramid of results by Connors and Smith. So you have a vision, and the vision defines the goals that you want to achieve from your strategy. And then you have some results achieve the goals, and then you might have some other results that make some other byproducts that are not 
for your goals. And in order to get, and now I need to scroll a bit here, in order to get the results you want, you need to do actions. Your actions will be driving the results. So what you do would create the results you have. But then some actions might be something that you, you never get the results you want, or they are not like useless access, actions, they are waste. And defining the actions, you need to take decisions. And you want to take fast decisions if things happen faster and faster and you have less time. So you need to give the people the way to decide themselves. And how do they decide? They will decide on the beliefs they have. And the beliefs they have, they come from their experiences. So if I put my hand on the iron, I know it's hot, I'm burnt, then I will know and I will have the belief that if the lamp is on, then it's hot, then I'd better don't touch there, because I will have this experience. And I will take a decision based on that hot iron is dangerous, put it in a, let it cool down in the right place. So, the upper part is actually what we are doing. Actually, it's not culture, it's structure. So, apologize for the typo. So, that is what we are doing, like the actions and the results. So, it's the org charts, the processes, the tools we use, the, the, the policies and the artifacts and roles we have. And the lower part is, that is the culture, it's what we are. So, that is like, the behaviors, the habits, the stories, and the rituals we have. Darren mentioned in the morning about culture and rituals and things, so I was quite happy to hear that. And we need to think a shift is needed. So we need to have people, managers, who want to lead an organization. They need to shift from managing to leading. They need to do more coaching, storytelling, creating the right environment, so that uh, people can, can have the right experiences and they can uh, facilitate that the right rituals and, and, and things happen. So that's also very important. So, doing change, you cannot plan everything. You cannot have like this comes in here and that you get what you get out. And you cannot focus on efficiency. You need to focus more on effectiveness. And you need to accept that the organization is uh, something more organic, that is a more lively thing, and that you have their behaviors, you have people working and collaborating, and you need to set the values and the rituals and the principles and focus that the organization works more on experience, uh, sorry, on uh, effectiveness. So this change, and Darren in the morning also mentioned, leadership is important, and that's what we think. With leadership, if you change from management and do more the leading and create the environment, then you can affect the ways. You want to have practices in the organization. Uh, and then we have in organic agility, there are five principles that are defined there that kind of give a guidance of uh, that if you follow those principles, then you will be able to reach the right practices. And there are some tools that can be used with that. So, leadership depends on, on three things. Depends on the attitude, what is the type of person and the personality the leader has, what is the culture, so how are we doing things in the organization, and the third thing is what is the situation. And those three, three things would kind of specify what uh, kind of leadership we will perform and, and show. And we have identified that there are like different types of leadership, but mainly you can like put them on five main leadership types. And we call them archetypes. If we do this exercise with, with organizations, there might even come seven archetypes, but we always have kind of the five common things. Um, so, you have the expert archetype, where is a leader, uh, who is on the top, he decides, he demands, he asks, he assigns the tasks to the people, and those tasks are done individually. 
So you have this one-on-one -on -one communication. The people don't need to communicate with each other. So it's a very process and result-oriented culture that you have there. Another archetype is the coordinator archetype. Still, you have the person coordinating and demanding in the middle, setting the tasks, but the collaboration among the people is allowed. The challenge here in this is that, no, that you start having kind of conflicts between the people. People have different op opinions. Oop. So you have a conflict here, and then you might have another conflict there. So those different opinions, and then the team needs to be able to have conflict management and resolve those conflicts and have this kind of ability of, of working together. Then you have another archetype of leadership where there is a peer archetype. So the person is equal and he tries to facilitate a bit the dynamics in the team and the collaboration. And he's more equal and he can accept the opinions of the other people. Here, what is cri critical is that the team does not spend much time on making decisions if they want to make jointly decisions. They need to learn to make decisions faster and how to get consensus. So that is the focus here. Then we have the coach archetype, where the person is outside the team. The team is doing all the operational stuff. They know what needs to be done. The coach is supporting and trying to help the team to grow and develop their skills. And yeah, he, he can like tell where, what direction they go, like the strategy, and that would be this kind of communication. And the last archetype is the strategist archetype. So in, in that archetype, uh, the leader is the link from the upper management or from the top to the team. The team understands the strategy and can give feedback to the leader hey, we think this and this is not right. So the leader can go back and can negotiate, and it's like kind of the communication channel. And ideally, they could even have access directly to the top. So they really know exactly by seeing the strategy what they need to do, and he's more like a serving and, and supporting and uh, challenging the team in, in, in strategic matters and getting their input. So now you have those different archetypes, and think if you have an uh, organization that is working on the strategic archetype, and then you give them a new leader, and he is having like the personality that, hey, I'm a micromanager. And he is like an expert archetype. How would that work together? There would be a huge conflict, right? So you need to match to the organization, also the leader, to be the right one. And you need to take the journey together. And how the leader can be developed? He needs to develop, first of all, his emotional intelligence. He needs to understand what are, that um, having emotions, based on the emotions you do your action, and based on your action, what you do and tell, and that creates uh, impact for, for the people. You get a response based on that. And your emotions come probably because of your needs. You have certain needs as a person. But you need to be aware as a leader. So you need to work inwards, so being self-aware of what are your feelings, and also do the self-management. You know, be aware, OK, I have this feeling on this emotion, but I will not let it come through, and I will not let it affect my, my, my action, because actually it's something else we need. Uh, so, and how you can do that is reflecting yourself, like good thing is to, to do your writing a log of, of how you feel in different situations and reflecting on that and visiting, and then active listening could be another thing. Uh, and then the outward, outward development of the emotional intelligence is to be aware about what is the situation from the team. Observe the team and the situation, observe what is the impact you create, how do they behave? What's the body language? And that's more challenging now when we work remotely, because you cannot see always the body language, or you see only this part, but you don't see this part. What behavior they might have hidden. 
So archetypes can help, and then creating the right, you know, nudging the right rituals or creating the right environment, that would be the social management. How you can develop from one place to the other? You cannot go straight from one end to the other. You need to go from one step to the other. And I mentioned some of the characteristics and the behaviors. Like if, you, if we take the example expert to coordinator. The expert is uh, demanding and he, he's assigning the tasks, uh, directing and demanding. The coordinator is like more coordinating and also demanding because he's still assigned. So what you can move from one place to the other, you have common behavior. You keep up the common behavior and then you reduce a bit the direction and you increase the collaboration and the coordination behavior. And this way you can shift a bit yourself and the team from one archetype to the other. Keep the common behaviors and then reduce the one that is not anymore in the next one and rise the other one. So teams that would take fast decisions and the goal would be to go totally on the right to be a strategist, if possible. I mentioned five principles. The first principle is to increase cultural awareness. So we talked a lot about culture, uh, and culture eats strategy for breakfast. Somebody mentioned Peter Drucker from the morning. So, and what's key here is to be aware of what culture you have. Because if you know where you are, and you know where you want to go, then you can take the journey, little by little. And another thing that's important is also to have the, uh, the, the coherence, meaning that people that you communicate with each other have the same culture. We work with the culture with a competing values framework. Uh, that's from Cameron and Quinn. Uh, in this framework, you have two axes. There you have the axis from top to down. That's like how flexible you are and how stable you are. And then you have the axis from right to left, how inward focused you are and how outward focused you are. And that changes, the, 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 it gives you four quadrants, and those are different cultures, and you can be less on the certain culture and more in one culture. So thinking on, on, on that culture, I'll give you an example. Um, if you think of a startup, the, the focus of a startup is to do creation of things, create new things. They work ad hoc, so they call this culture also ad hocracy culture. Uh, so they are like more entrepreneurs, the leaders, and, and uh, do it, want to do things and try out and get new fast feedback and, and experiment. Then if the startup grows, you get more people, you need to collaborate more, you need to have a bit the common discussion. You start being more like a family. You need to have the common meetings and the focus is like on, on the people and, and the employees more. Small companies do that and focus on that a lot. So that's a more collaborative culture. And the focus there is like developing the person's skills, uh, and doing the team building, you know, and getting the commitment of the team. People are, yes, we will do that. And if the company grows even further, then you go to the bottom left quadrant, and that's where you start having, you cannot know everybody because the company is already so big. So, if you go to some other department, you need to introduce yourself, you don't have the links, so you need to have processes and tools, and you start building hierarchy. And so that's a hierarchical culture or a process-oriented culture. And, you know, doing the things right is very important. Perfection. And then on the bottom right is like when, if you remember the market curve, when it starts declining, then it starts to talk more about market share, you want to much more have about efficiency. So then it's other things drive your culture. It's again more outward, and it's focusing on, on, on those, those having hard driving uh, leadership styles. So, uh, uh, the life cycle would go a bit like in this way. And now if you have a culture, or, some, some company that, or some, some group of people that is here, and then you have another group that is there. 
they're totally opposite. The one is inward and stability, the other one is outward and flexibility. They have different values, they have different way of com communicating and collaborating. And so if they need to talk to each other, they talk a totally different language and there is a conflict. And that happens in many organizations. They are not aware. Why does it take to get people on board? Why does it take? Why do they not accept our ideas? Because they are doing something totally different and used to be on a totally different side. So you cannot go in, in those two axes. You have like the, the conflict in, in the culture. That's why it's, it's competing values. Where is the agile culture? Any ideas? Nobody? It's at the intersection. At the intersection. We have drivers from each of the quadrants when we're doing agile. Mm -hmm. But where it would be more focused, if you cannot choose the intersection, if you can choose one or two quadrants. Both. On the top. Yeah, that's correct. So the, here on the top, we would be more agile. because we want to be more flexible, we want to, to focus more on adapt things faster and uh, focus on the people and the collaboration. If you are on the bottom left and you want to go to the top right, how can you do that journey? So if you are here and you want to go to the top right, you cannot go straight ahead. That will not work because you cannot change from one value to the total opposite value. So you need to go opposite to, to, to the next neighbor value and then go this way, or then go up and then go this way. That would be the way how you can evolve the culture. And that does not happen over, overnight. You know. There are many small experiments, rituals that you need to go to go first to the other one, and then from there you go to the next one. Like the example that was with this. Smoking in the morning, you, you needed to have uh, small steps to reach the final goal. Here also, so the leadership behavior would drive how we work, uh, and how we work would we drive then how, what we think of what is effective, and then what is effective would drive our values. So that also needs to be uh, clear on, on the culture. I mentioned about tools. We, we have been having a tool where we've been able to measure this. They're also like, you can do that with paper, but if you want to have continuous measurement, then you, you can automate things. So here we have different graphs, so we can identify uh, based on the, on, the, on the leadership style, we can on the uh, uh, orientation to work, on the effectiveness and on the values, and every green dot is a two minutes. Uh, every green dot is a positive thing and a red dot is a, is a negative thing. And that way you can identify where you are and how you can move. And if you have different islands, that's where it would be like. Okay, principle two, quickly, decide ba based on context. That is the Kinevin model. So uh, on the bottom right, you have things that are clear. You want to um, have like best practices. So first you sense. Uh, you categorize and you respond. Then on the top right, you have the complicated things uh, you, you sense. Then you need to find the expert that would do the analysis, and then you respond on that. And on the top left, you have the complex environment, and that's normally where we are with transformation and organizations. We don't know what we don't know, and we cannot analyze. So what we need to do there is we need to probe. And probing means we need to find and collect data to find and get information. And that we do with experiments. That's why experiments are very important. And then you have the chaotic environment where if the house is burning, you need to, to really act. If there is a crisis situation, you need to move to collect and, and get something. So you need to move from one place to the other to, to become to the better one. Focus on value creation, value streams. Uh, that would be creating your value streams end-to-end, -end, identifying the personas through interviews, then uh, the needs of the personas, and those are not the requirements, but the needs, uh, and then creating uh, clusters of the different projects 
and try to build teams around them. And best to, to build uh, based on existing projects that you have completed, then you can identify the skills and map the skills on your value stream that you have. And this way you can find what skills you need for a team to be cross-functional. Skill development can be done with uh, competency ma uh, mapping, and, and this also self-assessment, so you be aware, and then you get feedback by a peer, and then you discuss it in a group. And if you have this example here, for example, on the skill number four, you see that you are a bit more weak. The, the dots actually explain if it's a full dot, filled out dot, that you have knowledge there, and if it's less filled, then you have a less knowledge. So if that's a critical skill, then you need to work on that to develop this skill in the team. And if you have, an, uh, there was an example here, skill number six, where you have only one expert, so you might have like a single point of failure. If that guy gets sick, you cannot work on that. Doing things in small increments. Uh, we use a strategy map, agile strategy map. You have a goal, and you map the goal to potential success factors. So you have uh, success factors that are potential. You don't know if they would help you, and then you need to validate or invalidate those success factors. And if you have validated them, then you can move them like to confirm success factors. So you put them all in the future, the success factors, uh, you, you list them, you list the needed conditions, that are the NCs there, and then you start working on a few of them. And you validate or invalidate them, and you do that also with experiments. Optimizing the flow of value. There was a talk before about flight levels. That's the end-to-end -end flight level. If you have a Kanban board where all your activities are there end-to-end -end in, your, in your workflow. And then the leaders need to support this activity. You need to identify what are the blockers uh, and resolve those blockers, that would be. So those are examples of, of customers I've been working with. Uh, so eliminate dependencies would be another one trying to have one team to work throughout the, the, the value stream and offer the service, having pull, and limit the work in progress. But the most important thing is to focus, start finishing, stop starting. I see many companies start and start over and over. Sorry, I keep a bit more. Conclusion, do the things, the organizations are organic, don't do it, think that organization is a machine. Nobody is a robot. People are people, have feelings. Yeah. Leadership, will, with the help of the principles, will drive the practices you need to find. More information on the web page, Organic Agility, and this book explains in more detail the things I'm talking about. And now those are my contact details and questions. <laughs> Excellent, excellent, fantastic. Got time for a couple of questions just to get you ready because you're probably just thinking about your questions. I've got a few here, but are there any questions in the audience? I'll let you think about them for a second. Three here. Um, actions are creating the results. Yes. Beliefs and experiences should drive decisions. How common is it to actually dismiss decisions and just drift to actions? Um if you are in a hurry, and that's like if you're more comfortable, like in the, if you think about the deciding based on context, if you get too comfortable with the things that you're doing and the environment changes and you don't realize, then you might drop to the chaos situation. So you need to be always conscious of what you're doing and why you're doing something. Awesome. Love it, love it. Um, should we try to control desired feelings within an organization? Feelings are human, so I mean, it's good to tell your feelings, mm. but it's also, and the feelings come because of some need. And if they're bad feelings, mm. they might come due to some unfulfilled need that you have. So there is a point to look, and I would not suppress the bad feelings. I would accept people as they are. Love it, and I loved your slides on you know, the, the gin bottle and that kind of innovation and that kind of the changing in behaviors of people. Mm. And during lockdown, that significant change in, in the UK, 
Lots of people started, you know, getting beer as takeaways, and then business models changed. So because of this, this very accelerated way in which business models have changed, do you think the right, that, that people are more aware of the need to make these internal changes? Do you think people have woken up um, over the last, you mentioned all those significant um, I external factors. Yeah. Do you think people are now becoming aware of the fact that they need to be aware of the awesome things you've been talking about? I, th I think there is still way to, to, to go. And actually, I had one more thing I wanted to show. You know, you can, you're not alone that you can use coaches. You can use help for that. Because having an external view, more neutral, helps you, like, you know, assess and, and challenge you on your assumptions that you have in your culture. You might be blind on some things. Well, that was actually the final one. Where can we uh, find more information and discuss this in more depth? You can get back to me later Come on. and meet this man. <laughs> Come and find him. Yeah. Um, another round of applause. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. Thanks.